Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for being here. What we've heard loud and clear from Vermonters is that affordability, housing, and public safety are their top priorities. So that's why I asked the legislature to focus on these issues earlier in the year. So this week, we'll be talking about public safety. And I can't really begin without taking a moment to talk about Senator Sears passing last weekend. He and I, as along with John, served in the Senate for many years together, and he was someone I had a great deal of respect for. Just this past session, he worked closely with us to pass this, at the public safety legislation we'll talk more about today. And I don't think we would have gotten it where we did without it. So I share my gratitude for his service and decades long commitment to Bennington and my thoughts are with his family and friends, including all those in the Senate. A couple of weeks ago, I was asked if there was any bright spots this session. The first thing that came to mind was public safety. And that's because Senator Sears and Representative Lalonde were willing to work together to improve our policies. None of us got everything we wanted, <clears throat> but we each gave a little to come to a compromise we could all agree on. I've always believed public safety is the highest responsibility of any government. And that's why it's so important we get it right. In January, we proposed a public safety package to help make our community safer. I know many of us have heard from municipal leaders, business owners, community members, police chiefs, and others about the need for action sooner rather than later. And the data shows us they're right to be concerned, which is why I'm very happy we took a few steps forward. Just last week, I signed two major public safety bills into law, S-58 and S-195, which address a few of our collective concerns. We know many crimes in Vermont are the result of drug trafficking. S-58 increases enforcement of drug crimes, which is critical to slowing down the deadly supply of drugs coming into our state. We also focus on repeat offenses because existing policies have created a lack of accountability. We've all heard stories about people committing crimes only to be back out on the street recommitting just hours or days later. S-195 makes changes to the conditions of release and bail to give judges more tools to get people into court so they can hold repeat offenders accountable. I want to be clear, in order to be most effective, we need the courts to use these new tools to help keep our communities safe. And Vermonters should know, these bills are not going to solve all our problems, but they are important steps forward as we continue to focus on this issue. For more details on these new tools, I'll now turn it over to Tucker Jones from the Department of Public Safety. Thank you, Governor. Good, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tucker Jones with the Department of Public Safety, filling in for Commissioner Morrison today. Uh, I'd like to echo the governor's comments about Senator Sears. I'd like to highlight some of this public safety legislation, but before I do, I'd like to acknowledge his passing. Senator Sears was a key architect for much of the legislation I'm going to mention, uh, but he was also an extraordinary force in the Vermont Senate. In his committee room, Senator Sears expressed his views, and they were often strongly held, but he also maintained a genuine openness to changing his mind. The result was that whatever the outcome of a particular bill, people left with a sense that they got a fair shake from him. That and his remarkable institutional memory, dating back to the early 90s, were such valuable qualities in a legislator and his legacy will be long remembered by many. The commissioners at the Department of Public Safety, the colonel, and our entire policy team have learned a lot from Senator Sears, and we mourn his passing. With that said, here are some of the highlights for public safety legislation this session. First, S-195, as the governor mentioned, an act relating to how a defendant's criminal record is considered in imposing conditions of release, creates new ways 
to monitor people on pretrial release after they have been arraigned for a criminal charge. Over the next year, we will see whether these changes effectively address the so-called revolving door issue, where people who are charged with a crime continue to commit crimes while on pretrial release and in violation of court-ordered conditions of release. S-195 focuses mostly on monitoring pretrial defendants, and we will continue to examine whether the courts have enough tools to quickly enforce violations of conditions of release when they occur. The issue of repeated criminal activity by people already on pretrial release for other crimes gives rise to perhaps the greatest challenge with public safety and a perception that the existing tools to protect public safety can be ineffective. So we will continue to examine this issue between now and the next legislative session and work with stakeholders to address it further if necessary. Additionally, several bills this year filled gaps in the criminal law. S-58, an act relating to public safety, made some changes to juvenile jurisdiction, recognizing that certain firearm and drug offenses can present an immediate public safety risk and that those cases can begin in the criminal division in the discretion of the state's attorney for those 16 years of age and older. There were also some changes to drug laws in S-58, including a provision to make the sale and dispensing of xylazine a criminal offense. It was important to fill this gap because xylazine is now found in 55% of glassine bags tested by Vermont's forensic laboratory. Going forward, we will continue to, uh, to monitor emerging trends in any new substances that arise in overdose fatality and forensic lab data. Also, penalties for retail theft in H-534, an act relating to retail theft, have been changed to reflect the issue of people repeatedly committing this offense, but doing so below the felony threshold of $900. Likewise, H-563, an act relating to unauthorized entry and operation of motor vehicle, adjusts the language regarding the criminal offense of entering a motor vehicle or operating a motor vehicle without the owner's consent to make sure that behavior is adequately captured in the criminal law. And then finally, on a related note, H-872 made significant changes to the professional regulation of law enforcement officers by calling for a single, uniform, and enforceable code of conduct applicable to all law enforcement in the state. This code of conduct will provide greater clarity and transparency about what conduct is subject to professional regulation discipline. This will not only increase trust and accountability in law enforcement, but assure the law enforcement profession that regulation of the profession is handled in a clear, uniform, and fair manner at the state level. This is especially important today when recruiting and retaining public sector employees generally and law enforcement officers specifically is a key public safety goal. Right now, the functional vacancy rate at the Vermont State Police load is about 23% and attrition continues to outpace recruitment of new officers. Going forward this year, the Department of Public Safety's priorities will continue to be keeping our communities safe and reducing crime. To do this, the department is focused on three topics. First, this year the department will be monitoring the impact of the legislation that I just mentioned, with a focus on whether these legislative changes adequately address behavior that presents immediate public safety risks. Second, the department will continue its effort to recruit skilled troopers with hiring bonuses and recruitment awards. And third, the Department of Public Safety will continue its work with the Public Safety Enhancement Team, known as PSET, which is a state-level interagency group working with specific communities around the state to address resource coordination and the underlying drivers of criminal behavior in those communities. The PSET is part of the ongoing work set forth in the Governor's August 2022 10-point plan to apply the cross-government pandemic response model to reduce violence in communities. Thank you.
Hi, my name is John Campbell. I'm the executive director for the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. And um, if I could start seeing that we have all mentioned Dick Sears, I, I've got it. Uh, and as the governor mentioned, that uh, the governor, myself, and uh, Senator Sears were all in the legislature together, the Senate. And uh, in fact, then Governor Shumlin, uh, when he appointed me to the Judiciary Committee at first, he said, uh, Campbell, let me just tell you, your first and only job is to make sure to control his blood pressure. <laughs> and uh, because Senator Sears had a, for those of you who know, um, he, he certainly had a tendency to, to uh, uh, elevate it. Uh, but I, I tell you, the one thing that he, he was always constant, was always constant with him, was the fact that he was concerned for victims, victims of crime. Uh, that never lost, he never lost sight of that. And thankfully for that um, vision, we have had a wonderful uh, awareness. And I think the legislation, legislators in the uh, 2000s and the early, uh, the last 10 years, they, they really took that into consideration. However, uh, recently, and I don't think it's um, too, uh, not, I'm sure most people realize this, is that there's been a sort of a change, the, the change of um, accountability, uh, as the governor mentioned. There is, seems to be a, a lack of accountability and lack of consequences for actions that people take. And we're not talking about some of these, you know, young people who make bad decisions. We're, we're talking about people who've decided that they're going to have a criminal lifestyle, that's the way they're going to make their living, and they're going to prey on other people. Um, it's been very tough over the last few years to try to deal with uh, getting legislation passed that recognized that there are still many, many victims of crime, and they occur, it continues to occur on a regular basis. And so that's what um, I want to thank Governor Scott uh, and his team, and also for public safety for being over in the legislature with us, uh, trying to help push that uh, and to realize that, that there is a problem and that problem has to be dealt with because if not, no one's gonna be safe out there. No property's gonna be safe. It's just gonna continue to, uh, we're gonna continue to see uh, the problems that, we, that have arisen. One of the um, 195, the, the one bill that uh, Tucker had mentioned, there are two things in there that we really, or I should say three, that we're really uh, happy to have seen. Um, one <clears throat> removes the uh, $200 cap bail that was uh, put in place by the legislature a couple of years ago uh, for certain misdemeanors. And now the, the judges, um, they, can cons they will take into consideration whether or not an individual has uh, also been convicted of another crime or is uh, currently awaiting trial on a crime. So. Uh, they'll be able to take that into consideration when determining whether or not the $200 will be sufficient to determine whether that uh, person uh, will be a risk of flight. Uh, the second one is actually those conditions of release and dealing with a risk of flight. Uh, when making that determination of whether the conditions uh, are sufficient, the, uh, the courts now have to um, consider uh, two things. They'll, uh, not only will they consider um, the seriousness of the offense, uh, but also whether the defendant was currently out on other conditions of release, which we're finding a lot of, and whether or not they, um, the defendant was compliant with court orders and whether or not that person failed to appear prior uh, in a prior um, uh, hearing. One of the probably the most shocking uh, statistics that I that I heard, and I, I actually had when my team came to me and told me about it, I said, "You got to check that, that figure. That seems like a lot." But there's over 60 percent of the people uh, that, well, in fact, actually, there are currently about 21,000 cases, open criminal cases, and about 60 percent of those are have been committed by one uh, person, you know, one or more people. They will have one or more offenses that they've committed. So 60% of those um, cases, um, they this, the, um, involve persons with one or more criminal dockets. It's pretty shocking, the fact that there are so many multiple offenders. I know there's, there's several of them that we came across that have you know, 50 or 60 cases, outstanding cases. Uh, last year alone, 5,000 um, uh, arrest warrants were uh, issued for failures to appear. Uh, that just that just not cannot uh, continue. And and if we're going to be able to get our backlog or our court cases get through them, if we're going to try to get some semblance of order brought back to the state, we need to have that accountability. There, these defendants need to be brought uh, into court 
and they need to address uh, the crimes that they have allegedly committed. So uh, the final uh, issue in 195 that we're happy that was passed is that uh, the work crew uh, program, which the Department of Corrections uh, had to, uh, for resource uh, reasons, had to uh, abandon for a while, uh, that is now back on the table. And so we'll be having, a, I believe, a pilot program in, in several of the counties uh, to reestablish the work crew. Uh, again, thank you very much for coming, and thank you, Governor, for inviting us. Thank you, John. Thank you, Tucker. We'll open up to questions at this point. Governor, there's an awful lot of out-of-state drug crime going on. I've seen a lot of the violence and that's, that seems to be coming from people from out of state. Uh, can you talk about specifically how this legislation and how your policing practices will be trying to mitigate that? Well, first of all, uh, we have been trying to mitigate that for quite a number of years, and I um, want to thank our public safety team, um, the colonels here, and for all they've done. And, and you don't see that a lot uh, in terms of what's happening behind the scenes, um, but it's all productive, and it's difficult, and it's not easy. Um, so um, we'll continue uh, to work uh, on that approach um, in trying to cut off the supply before it arrives here. But that, <clears throat> that also um, relies on cooperation from other states, which we, we do as well. So this is a big team effort throughout the Northeast. It isn't just confined to Vermont. Everyone is, is experiencing this. Um, some of what we've seen as well with the bail is that um, uh, the conditions of release are implemented, um, but they don't show back up, and that uh, that goes for those in state and those out of state. So, I believe that this will be helpful in that regard. Um, when we see those repeat offenders, uh, to hold them accountable, and bring them at least get them into court uh, to face uh, face prosecution. So, that in itself, I think, would be helpful. Um, Tucker, anything else you'd like to add to that, or John? I, uh, Governor, I just think that one of the things you did say, and, and I, um, I think is really important for us to know, is that the, especially 195, it gives tools to the to the judiciary, but the judiciary are going to have to be the ones that actually uh, take those uh, and and enforce them. So uh, we're hoping, and I'm sure with our, we have some incredible judges uh, on the bench, and so they're the ones that are going to have to implement the. Um, uh, and help with the finding these individuals who really have little respect for the judicial system here, and uh, to especially with the repeat offenders. Dean, anything you want to add to that, or Colonel? Anything you want to add to the policing sure. aspect? Thank you, Governor. Uh, Matt Birmingham, Director of the State Police. Uh, I'll just echo a couple of things the Governor said. Uh, first of all, this is a nationwide problem, this drug epidemic. Um, and it is compounded by the uh, prolific introduction of fentanyl and heroin into our drug markets around the country. And I'll also echo what the governor said is that uh, this is a, this is a, not only is a nationwide problem, but the, the nationwide effort to, to, to really get our arms around this. Uh, there's a significant demand for these drugs in Vermont and across the nation. Uh, we have to stay focused on uh, demand reduction. We cannot uh, forget about that because that's what's <clears throat> driving the economics of the drug trade. And <clears throat> excuse me, law enforcement will continue to focus on the supply chain. These are very dangerous groups that are operating around the country, um, starting with the drug cartel in Mexico. Uh, we work very closely with our federal partners. Um, there are many federal agencies that, that work on this issue nationwide, uh, but they are moving a tremendous amount of fentanyl and heroin, and now you hear xylazine as part of the, the mix. These are incredibly dangerous and deadly drugs, um, and law enforcement will continue to work on, on the supply side. But I, I have to reiterate it, and, and you're seeing it across the state. These are, these are violent groups, and they're bringing the violence to Vermont, and we're seeing it all the time here uh, in shootings and homicides that are drug related. Uh, so that is concerning to law enforcement in this state and um, something that we are laser focused on. The, Ver the Vermont State Police administers the Vermont Drug Task Force, which is a statewide multi-jurisdictional um, drug enforcement group and made up of uh, state 
county and local officers and federal agents. Uh, and they are laser focused on um, bringing the suppliers and the supply chain and the people who are profiting on this and preying on victims uh, to justice. So it's, uh, it's good to see the, the, some of the gaps that Tucker talked about being closed in, in the, the criminal statutes. So that's all. Thank you. might be a question for Colonel Birmingham, but I know the, the Biden administration maybe six months, eight months ago worked out a deal with China where they were going to manufacture or they were going to export less of a chemical that is a base of part of fentanyl, the hope being months, maybe years down the line, we're seeing less fentanyl coming into the country. Is that is that the case? Has that paid off at all? I mean, I, Go wait, I, I, yeah, I can't speak to the Biden administration's policies on this. I, I can tell you that a, a lot of the precursors for fentanyl come from China, and they are manufactured in in uh, Mexico and in areas outside the country. It, fentanyl is a is a 100% chemical compound. Um, so unlike heroin, where you have to grow um, plants, uh, fentanyl can be created in labs and laboratories across the world. Um, so I know that uh, you know. The United States government in its entirety is working um, very hard to prevent the precursor chemicals from coming into the United States, and they're working very hard to prevent these these clandestine and sometimes open laboratories from producing uh, fentanyl and dangerous chemical compounds, and then preventing that from entering the United States. But as you can see, it's an incredible challenge. <coughs> I'm going to switch topics unless you guys have anything else on public safety. I have one more on public safety, Steve. Uh, mentioned, uh, I, I guess that there's in the budget hiring some new state's attorneys, uh, deputy state's attorneys. How, do, how are you going to make sure that they're not, pardon me for saying, but clones of Sarah George who, who basically don't want to incarcerate anyone anyway? I mean, how do, someone, people who actually will uh, deliver justice. Yeah, well, these are elected positions, so there's not a lot of control in some respects from, from our office, but maybe John has some ideas. Um, first of all, I, I don't think I, I would I can um, agree with you on your uh, how you describe Sarah George. Um, all the prosecutors are elected, as you said, uh, individually. They have uh, discretion within their departments. They all have different um, challenges for each one of the counties that they're in. Um, I do know, though, that the uh, individuals that uh, positions that we received were very happy to have gotten those, uh, and they will help us with not only the backlog but also to prioritize uh, those crimes uh, that we're dealing with. And you have to also understand that that things have changed in the last few years. The, the, not only have the, crime, the crimes become more complex. Mm -hmm. But there are also more requirements on the part of the, the attorneys, the state's attorneys, prosecutors, um, such as uh, reviewing all of the uh, the body cams and the and the uh, cameras from the from all the vehicles. They have to sit there and go through hours and hours and hours, and for one person to try to do that, um, and those are in almost every every matter. So um, it's 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 a tough uh, challenge, but I, our folks are up to it, and we're I believe that we have a uh, all of our offices are, are efficient, and I think they're they're going to do a great job. John, we're we're seeing staffing shortages across state government, across the workforce. These are really specialized positions. Whether we're talking judges, state's attorneys, public defenders, how much of a, an impact, or, or what's your confidence level that we're going to be actually that the money is going to solve the problem? I don't think money is going to be the only solution. I don't think that uh, we can uh, spend our way out of this. Um, I think that it's going to be a combination. Uh, it's going to be a ch combination of changes in some of the laws like we've seen. Uh, again, I cannot stress the fact that I, you know, we need to start saying to people, you, we're going to hold you accountable, and there are going to be consequences for your actions. Um, until we do that, until we get serious, then people are just going to uh, you know, continue to act like this with impunity. They're just going to say, um, and then that makes our jobs uh, a lot tougher. Fortunately, we have people in our department that they don't know what a 40-hour work week is. You know, it's always uh, far in, in excess of that. And because they're public servants and they really believe in what they're in the job that they're doing, um, I think they are. At least we hope that they're going to stay on. And, um, and we do. We have a very good. 
uh, rate as far as you know keeping our folks uh, and I, I think the retention rate for for employees and so I think that uh, again these dedicated individuals are going to be making a difference as well if I could just add um, the demographics that we're facing the, the crisis we're facing in that regard is our highest priority in some respects we see in every single sector throughout Vermont, whether it's in public service or private service, private individuals, and so forth, every single sector is suffering in terms of workforce. So um, I, I talked about this previously, but I'll give these three uh, numbers again. But when you look at uh, the census from 2010 to 2012, uh, we have 14,000 fewer kids under the age of 18 than we did in 2010. And uh, with the age group uh, 40 to 54 um, is about uh, about 24,000 less. I mean, that's that's the meat of our workforce. That's the, that's the center. And then um, over the age of 65, there are 40,000 more. So that tells you pretty much everything you need to know about what we're facing here in Vermont as we try and bring more people in. Um, we're trying to keep more people here, um, but, uh, but it really is about resupplying our workforce. And how do we do that? You know, housing is a barrier for us. Um, the other barrier for us, from my perspective, is the cost of living, the cost of living in Vermont. And that's why we work so hard uh, to try and make sure that we don't raise taxes and fees any more than we have to. Uh, so that we can attract more people uh, to the state and keep more people here. So it's all has to work together, but um, demographics is really our biggest challenge. Governor, do you recommend that people arm themselves for self-defense? I don't, I wouldn't recommend that, um, but, um, but for those who, I mean, they should do what they think is right for them uh, mm -hmm. in whatever situation that is. Uh, but at the same time, um, this, you know, this isn't the wild, wild west either. Um, we have to be judicious, judicious about our use of firearms, uh, make sure that we're, we're safely using them, and that we're safely storing them as well. And I, I have a gun safe full of guns, but they're in the gun safe. And so I think that um, we just have to be careful about our use of them. And, uh, but if you have them, uh, you have to make your own own decision about whether you uh, keep them close or not. Thank you. Within the last hour, you vetoed the old bill. Um, I think we were all pretty much expecting that, but you've also kind of been teasing this potential different option. Do you have any updates on that? And you also mentioned how you wanted to discuss with House and Senate leadership as that happens. Well. Yeah, we um, we reached out to the House and Senate. Uh, we received a response, I think, from the Senate, but maybe it was the House as well. Um, and uh, I think it was determined that they wanted to wait until they, that I, when I did veto uh, the bill. And so that's why I decided to get it out quickly. We received it this morning. Uh, there was no real decision to make from my standpoint. And we wanted to make sure that there was enough uh, runway now uh, to have those discussions. So I think we have something scheduled for next week. You shouldn't expect uh, there's going to be anything different uh, than what we've been talking about. Maybe a little bit of variation of some of what we've uh, we've testified on in some of the committees, uh, but um, but I think there's a path forward, and I hope that they will take it seriously uh, because there really is two ways to accomplish this. Um, one, they override the veto, which they have the supermajority fully capable of doing that. Secondly, is um, to work with us um, to try and reduce rates, to try and uh, put some constraints on future budgets, to try and um, find some ways uh, to, and we have ideas uh, about this, uh, to fix the structural issues we have with our education system. So I'm hoping that they'll work with us and that we can give Vermonters relief in that regard. because. Uh, double-digit increase in property taxes is, um, as much as we've talked about it, will be a surprise to many. What happens if 
they don't override and they don't work on a deal if there's no yield bill essentially can you walk us through what happens then? I, I don't think we even have to consider that I mean there is a provision for that um, but um, but they've already said that they are willing to talk at least talk and listen and um, they'll have to do their own counting they they know what their numbers are and uh, they think they can override they think that's the right path that's what they'll do they've shown they can do it I'm sure they can do it again how are school districts <coughs> excuse me how are school districts supposed to take this news I, I there were a handful of school budgets that passed this week but there's still some that have yet to pass a budget they are going to be you know budgeting and they're thinking about that 87 percent rule which if we don't have a deal I guess how, what do you how, what do you think that again school districts I just do? don't think that that should be a consideration we will we'll come to some We'll come to some agreement before that happens. I'm confident of that. Governor, you've been saying that um, you're hoping for more centrist candidates. The deadline was May 30. Or I guess probably you and your folks have looked at who's filed and who hasn't. How do you think that's going? Are you, are you getting more centrist candidates? I think we're seeing a few. Um, not as many as I'd like, but, um, but we're seeing a few. I mean, we're, we're again suffering from the same thing that everyone else is. Uh, it's this demographic challenge. People I, I talk with have said uh, either they want to, you know, they have so much going on in their lives, they have their work, their businesses, and so forth, and they just can't take the time to do this. Not right now, maybe later. And then others say, you know, if I was only younger, uh, I would do this. But now they're looking forward to retirement and they don't want to do this either. So uh, there's a certain amount, I, I use the term apathy out there, um, but, um, but I think it's more of an unwillingness uh, to put yourself out there into the scrutiny uh, that you, you endure. And we're seeing more and more of that, not just here in the state, but um, throughout the country, the polarization, uh, the divisiveness, and, uh, and social media as a way of you know, just tearing families apart. So, some people say, why would I want to put myself through that? What do you think it'll mean for the balance of power next session? I mean, I know there's, I think, 70 or so uh, challenge seats in the House, you know, on the Senate side. How do you see that working next session? I hope it will see more balance. That's what we need. And uh, I think it actually would help the process. Um, at this point in time, when you have a supermajority, you don't have to speak to the executive branch. You don't have to listen to them. You can continue to do what you want to do and just force it through. Um, when there's uh, when you don't have that supermajority, uh, then you have to come to the table. And then I think the, the results are better for Vermonters at that point. Senator Mazza, Senator Sears, Senator Kitchell won't be there in the Senate. How does that factor into it? Uh, you know, and, and how does how will that fundamentally, if at all, change the the nature of the session? Yeah. This year? Well, we're going to see a, a huge shift uh, in the Senate. We've seen some shift uh, even in the last election, and uh, these some of these folks uh, who are leaving, the majority of them this year, um, I would classify as being moderate centrists. Uh, Bobby Starr, Senator Mazza, Senator Sears, Senator Kitchell, and uh, it's going to be it's going to be difficult uh, but um, but hopefully we'll have um, opportunities uh, to bring new centrists in to the equation earlier this week um, you signed the transportation bill um, and you've always talked about taxes and fees and not raising them but there are those new EV fees that will be added I know it's making up for lost gas tax yeah. but did raising those fees and creating them kind of play a role in your decision making with that or it's just fair that it's balancing that no out? I think uh, again from my perspective I think it's a user fee I think everyone has to pay something uh, so that we can keep our our roads uh, in good order uh, we can we can replace bridges uh, the infrastructure is important and then we have to match all the funds that we're we're uh, we're contemplating over the next few years so I think it's just a fairness theme from a fairness standpoint I think that it was the right thing to do all right we'll go to the phones Tom Davis Compass Vermont no. uh, 
Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Governor, you're talking about um, uh, the law and how to, you know, keep people, dangerous people off the street, but do you anticipate running into constitutional problems on that? Um, you can't incarcerate people forever, right? No, but we can get them through the judicial system, and that's what we that's what we need to do. We just want to make sure that they have their day in court and they show up for their day of court in court, and and then the, it's uh, adjudicated. Okay, thank you, Governor. Keith Whitcomb, Rutland Herald. Uh, hi. Um, so with regards to incarceration, I was sort of curious um, sort of how our prison system is going. Like, do we have enough room for people? Is there enough staff in the prisons, cost to ship them out of state whenever that's needed? Or is that, what, what's that looking like? I remember years ago, this was talked about a lot. I don't know what the, the state of it is now. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's fairly steady at this point. It may have elevated a bit since the pandemic. Uh, but um, but in, in terms of the incarceration rate, uh, staffing levels have increased. I think uh, the commissioner has done a great job in trying to promote uh, the, the department and bringing more people in. So that's been very, very helpful. And it's still not, you know, we're not, we're not declaring victory here, um, but, it's, uh, but it's substantially better than it was a year ago or two years ago. Um, so we're, we're good from that standpoint. But let's... Let's be clear about this. Some of what we're talking about today, um, we're hoping that this will be more of a deterrent so you don't commit the crime, so you don't end up in prison, uh, so that we can head some of these things off and that, and that we hold people accountable uh, so that we're not an easy mark here in Vermont. So I think that's part of our goal, uh, unless anything you want to add to that, John or Tucker? No, I, I, I think number one is we try to keep people out of the system, uh, and that is convincing you know, people that number one, if you if you decide to that you want to uh, commit an illegal act, that there is going to be consequences for that, and they're not going to be you know three, four, five years down the line; they're going to be immediate. Uh, so we'll try to do that, and, and also. Uh, the communities uh, themselves, uh, hopefully the resources that they have there will uh, try to work with uh, the young, uh, our, our youth to, uh, to uh, help uh, keep them out of the system as well. But uh, you like to try to do that, but if not, um, you know, if they're going to be in the system, we're going to say that there's going to be uh, some consequences for your actions. Thank you. Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. No. Okay. Back to the room. What kind of consequences? If it's not going to be prison, well, I'm not, not saying I'm not saying it's not going to be prison, but in the long run, it's not our goal to put more people in prison. Our goal is to keep the crimes from happening in the first place, and to hold people accountable and show that there are consequences. I think will alleviate some of that. What kind of consequences are we talking about? What, what's Incar the alternative Incar Incarceration. Oh, I don't know. I mean, there's... Some of the consequences we're, t we're talking about, uh, in addition, uh, clearly, if someone's going to commit a, a serious crime, there's you know, incarceration obviously is an, as an option. But, but the other thing is like what we're seeing now when these people aren't showing up to court and pretty much thumbing their nose at the whole system. Uh, the consequences are that the fact that they can be uh, that the judiciary will be able to um, put a, a bail uh, order bail. Uh, they'll be order able to uh, order additional conditions of release that will be monitored and if they violate these conditions of release uh, the sanctions will uh, will um, uh, then become uh, harder and the judge of course is going to be up to the judiciary what they decide to do at that point uh, but that that is why we need to have the judiciary uh, to have, have provided them these tools so that they can do this otherwise the system that we have now uh, is one where Eric, people know that you know what, I don't need to go to court, you know, even though I got cited here, because nothing's going to happen to me. That's, that message has got to, has got to stop. Yeah. Governor, earlier this week you signed Senate Bill 25 banning PFOS in textiles, uh, 
personal hygiene products, menstrual products, turf, uh, et cetera. What, what went into your, your rationale and your, your thinking behind that? Well, these are, we've learned uh, over the years, these are forever chemicals. They, they don't dissipate. Um, so we need to get them out of the system. Uh, and there are replacements uh, for that. So it isn't uh, PFAS or nothing. It's there are alternatives. So that's what went into my thinking. We're paying a heavy price uh, here and throughout the country for these forever chemicals, and we uh, we need to make sure that we stop the supply. My understanding in the bill is there's exemptions for if we don't have, let's just say, for the pads or tampons, for instance, if there isn't a suitable alternative at the same scale and the same price, there's exemptions for it. At the same time, like ski jackets and rain jackets, the industry is already kind of moving to remove PFAS upstream anyway. Uh, do you, how, how much of an impact do you think this, this bill would make? Well, I think anything will help at this point. Uh, again, these, um, it doesn't take uh, much to impact those, uh, the water supplies. So um, the, we just need to send the message that we got to have to accelerate this because this isn't helping our environment and it's costing us a lot of money. Uh, Governor, you vetoed uh, H-645 of restorative justice, I believe, setting a lack of uh, funding at the present time, which um, uh, Attorney General Clark acknowledged, but still disagreed with her statement. Um, do you have a response to her? Yeah, I have no response uh, to her in particular, but um, when I have a bill that comes across and there's funding that's needed, positions that are needed in order to accomplish whatever the bill uh, is supposed to, is intended to do, and there's no funding. It's not a lack of funding. There's no funding. Um, it's just not good government. It's, it's like pushing it off. Uh, what, what I heard was uh, the Attorney General had hoped to go in in January and budget adjustment and get the money. Well, that's, that's just, again, bad government, bad financial planning. And uh, we don't know if there's going to be any money left uh, to distribute at that point in time. So, um, again, um, we would encourage, I, I had heard that, that there are things she can do in preparation for that, and I would say she ought to move forward with that and go back at it in January. But again, I fully expect the legislature with a supermajority to to at least attempt to override that. Maybe they'll be successful, but it's just, again, it's just a financial, it's not the, the bill itself or what it's intending to do. It's just rushing at the end and not putting any money in. Um, that, that's just poor planning. And uh, have you heard about the um, looming Canadian border workers strike? that could be happening and how might that impact Vermonters either traveling or commerce-wise across the border? I have, I have not um, heard about that. But if it's Canadians, then we'd welcome them in. Um, they can stay a while. Um, it being the 80th anniversary of D-Day, you put up a statement earlier that it's important to you. I guess if you could just kind of give us a few words or talk about its importance to you today. Yeah, I mean, you know, history has a way of repeating itself, and I think uh, D-Day was a, an occasion where a lot of brave young men uh, met their death, and uh, tens of thousands of them uh, to liberate Europe, to liberate France. And uh, it was a turning point in World War II, the greatest generation. And uh, so as we reflect on that, uh, we should honor those we, we lost, um, but also thank the ones who survived and thank the ones who are still alive today um, because there won't be another opportunity, I don't believe, another monumental occasion for D-Day. Uh, I don't think we'll see any World War II vets there that were on that, um, that important day. Governor, the Alliance Defending Freedom has filed suit on behalf of some Christian parents against DCF for uh, their, DCF says you need to affirm uh, trans uh, education for children, and these Christian parents, foster parents don't want to do this. 
Um, do you have a, a position on that? Yeah, these are the times when I, um, I'm going to miss Senator Sears in some respect. Um, he fostered, he was a foster child himself. He fostered many children. And uh, I would ask him what he thought about this situation. There's no doubt uh, we need more foster parents. Um, we need people uh, to take care of uh, some of the youth, uh, the children uh, that have been neglected and left behind. Um, having said that, um, I know that we, you know, we have criteria uh, that um, that we uh, we want to make sure, and it all is geared towards the children. You know, how do we best serve the children? So, uh, having said that, again, um, I know that there's a, there's a lawsuit pending. Um, there's not much I sh probably should say at that point, uh, but um, but I just want to remind everyone. Our whole goal here is to protect the kids. The state is coming up on the one year anniversary of last year's floods. Um, is there anything that the state is kind of planning to do to commemorate that, or how are you feeling? Yeah, no, no, it? we will we'll be working uh, to come up with um, a day of kind of reflection where we are today, where we were then. Uh, whatever, what do we need to continue to work on? And uh, so we'll, we'll be taking that up in July. How are you feeling about where the state is at 11 months later? Um, you know, again, I think we've, we've done a pretty good job in some respects. I think uh, communities have done a good job as well. And uh, it was a, a tough, you know, you think back just less than a year ago. Um, and it was uh, pretty devastating here in Montpelier and Barrie and Johnson and, and Hardwick and so forth and down in Ludlow. Um, so we've come a long ways uh, and, uh, and there's always challenges uh, that we face, uh, FEMA being one of them, um, but we've been fortunate to work with them in a number of areas, but still a frustrating bureaucratic process and we know uh, we have a long ways to go. So. Again, everyone, legislature has been uh, helpful, and uh, we have a great team. Uh, Doug Farnham is here. He's uh, he's heading this effort up. And Doug, anything you'd like to say on this? Yes, sir. Where we are, and thank you, Governor. So, Douglas Farnham, the Chief Recovery Officer. As the governor said, a lot of our communities have done an amazing job, and they're still working very hard. The main vehicle for that, of course, you've got your municipal staff that are still focusing on projects, but then you've got the long-term recovery groups, and that's really the groups that are connecting to a lot of the households and need continued support. So the state is working with those groups, trying to support them. FEMA is helping us with the community assistance program. So we're, we're, gonna, we're about to be a year in, and most states take three to five years to, discuss, to recover from a disaster of this size. And of course, that's not, you know, you wait three years and then you're recovered, right? It's constant work over that whole period. So I do think we have the structures in place, we have the relationships, and, and we're building on that. And we have a lot of individual situations that we're still just trying to manage and find the best options for those individuals. So I think that, that um, you know, stopping and looking back and updating a year after will be good, but we still just need to keep pushing, especially with a short construction season. We need to, we need to make all the hay we can this summer, right? So um, that's one thing we're really focused on right now. And then we're going to turn to, okay, what does this mean for preparing for future disasters? How do we, how do we think about the structure going forward? Um, but this, this construction season is really important for a lot of families to prevent them from having to struggle through another winter season. How, how is the, the plan to redevelop the north end of Barrie? How's that coming along? So the governor appointed Pat Moulton as uh, Central Vermont's regional recovery officer. Pat has been instrumental in maintaining a really close relationship with Barrie, Montpelier, Marshfield. A lot of those communities that really have to think about, okay, um, how much transformational change is needed. I think the congressional delegation has been fighting hard for us. But the conditions in Washington haven't resulted in a, a disaster supplemental with a lot of discretionary funding. So actually, over the last three days, we held recovery symposium for the uh, municipalities, which tried to connect them with the existing federal programs. 
So instead of having a big pot of discretionary federal money that we can take on that project with, we're still attacking it. We're still working on it constantly, trying to secure grants through the EPA, other sources. We're really just, we're still working towards it. It's just more of chipping away at it than it is one big grant is going to make this happen. There's a couple opportunities out there that I'm excited about, that if those happen, we'll see a big chunk of that come in. And some of the community discussions in Barrie have been amazing, really seeing that community come together and figure out what they're comfortable with, what type of housing they want, because that's the most important thing, right? What type of housing situations does your community want and need? Governor, you, you cited working with FEMA is like sometimes it's challenging. How so? Can you elaborate? Well, it's just a bureaucratic process. I mean, it's um, they've uh, implemented many guidelines and so forth um, that are difficult to adhere to, and they don't they aren't always user friendly and we're a small state so again we're working through them but um, but this is nothing new i mean it's we've been dealing with fema on a lot of different uh, areas uh, over the years think uh, think irene uh, and it's just but a finer point on how long it takes to recover within it was just within the last year i think that we we finalized the last project from irene so it takes time. Mm -hmm. Governor, I have just one follow-up on the property tax um, issue. You mentioned you had put out a proposal or floated ideas to the speaker in Pro Tem. Is it? Are we still talking about the one, like the the Commissioner Bolio plan, the payback? Is that still the structure? You're yeah, a lot of things that. Uh, Commissioner Bolio has spoken about and testified to um, are part of this plan. And, but there's been a few changes, and we haven't presented that to them uh, yet, but we hope to next week. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you, Governor.